pass the floor to the moderator of this session, Mr. Joel Bamford, uh, Senior Director of Mergers from UK Competition and Market Authority. If you please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so firstly, thank you for all coming back after that delicious lunch. Um, we hope we can make this an entertaining session to combat both your full stomachs and the slightly warmer room. Um, we we'll, won't be having slides. We're going to do a bit more of a Q&A style panel and are aiming to leave a little bit of space at the end for audience questions. So we'll be testing your levels of awakeness and just seeing that you are able to engage. <laughs> So we've got a very experienced and eminent panel who I will shortly introduce. But one thing I have done is I'm sure over the years you've heard a number of panels like this being introduced as so-and-so has 20 years of experience and know exactly what they're doing. Um, we'll do the same here, but we'll also try to give you a little bit of a background on their uh, interactions with Japan and some kind of interesting facts. So firstly, we have Hannah Antolainen, who has as I said, 20 years of experience in competition law. She's worked for the European Commission since 2011 and is currently head of unit at uh, DG Comp dealing with merger control. Aside from that, she's also a big fan of karaoke uh, and is very much looking forward to joining the Japanese experience while singing her personal favorite, Bon Jovi's Bed of Roses. <laughs> Second up, we have uh, Hiroyuki Odagiri who is a, a highly qualified economist and was commissioner of the JFTC until October 2016. He has a large amount of, ex of research experience both in Japan and abroad, and currently he is a special advisor to the JFTC on a non-full-time basis. Hiro is a big fan of jazz and will be happy to give anybody any recommendations for good jazz clubs in Tokyo. Next up we have John Davies, who's a partner of Freshfields and was former uh, co-head of the firm's global competition group. He divides his time between Brussels uh, and London. And John will be back in Japan this time next year in a very different capacity, pursuing his keen interest in rugby at the Rugby World Cup. He's particularly looking forward to seeing the match between Scotland and Japan. <laughs> and finally, we have uh, Trevor Mackay. Trevor is the Associate Deputy Commissioner of the Mergers Directorate at the Canadian Competition Bureau. Uh, as myself and Hero, he's a fellow economist and has spent the last 10 years uh, at the Bureau almost exclusively doing mergers work. This is Trevor's first trip to Tokyo, but Trevor was married in South Korea in full traditional South Korean clothing and is looking forward to comparing and contrasting clothing here. Uh, for myself, I guess I can't leave that out. So my name is Joel Bamford. I'm Senior Director of Mergers at the CMA. Um, I am an economist um, and have worked at mergers all the way back to the days of the OFT. Um, my fun fact about Japan, so I actually uh, have been studying Japanese martial arts for about 20 years, um, hold a, a couple of black belts and hope to uh, experience the uh, Judo Kodokan, which is the home of Judo here in Tokyo. So on to our session. So the ICN um, has been um, looking at vertical mergers in the last couple of years uh, in respect of a couple of areas. So last year we did a survey of the ICN members. Um, we had over 40 agencies respond and we had some quite interesting results which I'll give a little bit of background to to kind of set the context. Um, we are currently taking a more in-depth review of how different jurisdictions assess uh, three case studies in particular. And we would welcome anybody in the room and anybody back in your agencies giving their experiences of the cases that they've looked at and how they have looked at them. So the three cases that we'll look at this year are Live Nation Ticketmaster, Essilor Luxottica, and Abbott Laboratories Allaire. So we welcome any input that you would like to give on that. And with respect to our survey that we carried out last year, most uh, authorities reported that they had intervened in a vertical merger in the last three years. However, compared to horizontal mergers, the intervention rate was about one in 10. So for every 10 horizontal interventions, there was one vertical merger. Um, John has already pointed out to me that all agencies apart from three said that they also looked at efficiencies, and we'll be exploring that in today's session. Um, and although competition authorities said that they typically used behavioral remedies to address vertical mergers, almost a third of cases were addressed with structural remedies or prohibition, and this was a growing element in the um, remedy process for vertical mergers. The survey also found that very similar theories of harm 
we looked at, particularly in relation to input and customer foreclosure. And we're going to start the session with a little bit of a kind of a background vertical mergers. So I'm going to start by asking Trevor um, what he sees as the key competition concerns in vertical mergers. Great. Thanks very much, Joel. So uh, just to start out, while vertical, vertical mergers obviously um, are, are more rare than the, their the horizontal counterparts, um, the standard unilateral effects theory of harm that you use for closure analysis has actually been around for many, many years and is pretty widely used. Um, interestingly, at least to myself, if no one else, um, the Canadian merger guidelines uh, up until 2011 um, didn't articulate any, with any great detail anything about the border closure analysis that should be used, but we had been still nevertheless doing that analysis um, for many, many years before that. I think that's illustrative of, of kind of the lesser emphasis that's, that's often placed on vertical uh, cases, the idea that, that, that uh, generally speaking, they, they tend to raise fewer concerns, uh, something that's expressly kind of expressed in our, um, in our merger guidelines, um, um, for sure. Um, so foreclosure analysis obviously looks at the ability to limit or eliminate uh, a rival firm's access to inputs and markets. Um, it can be partial foreclosure. Um, generally speaking, that's uh, um, raising prices to your rival in an effort to raise their costs. Um, or it could be complete foreclosure, that's, that being denying access to an input or to, to customers. Um, it, as I state, can be input or customer foreclosure, um, with customer foreclosure kind of being that less common uh, and a little bit less intuitive uh, of the two. Um, whereby uh, you're, um, you're looking to kind of um, either cut off um, the rival firm's ability to supply um, or trying to demand lower prices of them. Um, to determine if foreclosure is likely, we're going to look at uh, ability and incentive. Um, ability is really an assessment of market power in the, in the upstream and the downstream markets. Uh, it's really the, that, that bread and butter analysis in antitrust where you're looking um, at availability of substitutes, you're looking at uh, effective remaining competition, market shares, barriers to entry, et cetera. Um, the incentive side of things is more of a quantitative exercise. Oftentimes, it's a, it's a cost-benefit analysis of what you gain from that foreclosure versus and kind of offsetting that with what you may lose. Um, looking specifically at the vertical case experience in Canada, um, we've looked at it quite frequently and quite, uh, quite frequently we've, looked, we've done vertical cases. Um, a common theme in ones that didn't raise concerns, um, I would say, is it would be a lack of market power in either of the upstream or the downstream markets. We've kind of failed to get past that ability prong of the ability and incentive analysis. Um, you know, said differently, something like effective remaining competition or low barriers to entry would make um, a foreclosure strategy unprofitable or unsuccessful. Um, cases that did raise concerns, I'd ca characterize almost exclusively as um, partial input foreclosure cases. Um, a couple examples of relevant industries where we, um, we looked at mergers that raised pretty significant concerns would be um, in TV programming and broadcasting. Um, another one would be uh, the pharmaceutical wholesale and, and retail um, segments. Um, in those cases, it was partial foreclosure, and that was either because right, uh, existing regulation prevented full foreclosure, or simply that the, the profit incentives were such that it wasn't, gonna, it wasn't likely going to lead to full foreclosure, but only partial. Um, the quantitative analysis in that, I think if it teaches us anything, it's that we tend to get high price effects um, borne out when um, the, the merged entity is going to have um, a high enough market share in the downstream market that they're going to recoup a lot of the, the diverted sales from their rival. Um, but not so high that the elimination of double mar marginalization is going to dominate in terms of an effect. Um, so that's foreclosure analysis in a nutshell and, and relating it to Canada. I would make one additional note with respect to Canada, and that's that while that's the analysis that we use and it's very standard, um, we have not had a vertical case go all the way through the court system. Um, so the analysis is, is in that regard untested in the courts. Um, quickly, I'll also touch on Another area where you typically um, uh, may look at, um, at potential concerns with vertical cases, uh, and that relates to access to competitively sensitive information. 
um, of, by virtue of that customer or supplier relationship with your rival. So there we would look at what information the vertically integrated firm is going to have access to, um, whether that information is competitively sensitive in nature, uh, and then whether access to that competitively sensitive information is going to substantially impact competition in a relevant antitrust market, lead to a substantial lessening of competition. Um, we've had a few cases uh, where we did find issues in that regard and sought remedies. Um, typically, um, it was found that the sharing of the confidential information um, would facilitate transparency in the marketplace with respect to variables such as uh, prices, costs, or output. Um, uh, again, a couple of relevant industries uh, where we looked at wa were uh, telecom and then again in the pharmaceutical space. Um, an example of a specifically articulated concern um, on our part uh, in the pharma uh, example was that access to rivals' confidential information um, would have let the merged entity uh, anticipate and react um, to promotional activities of the rival firms in such a way that um, those promotional activities would be less profitable for the rival firm and thereby dampen the incentive to, to kind of engage um, in those promotional activities. Um, so those are a couple of examples of the, or the, the, the main examples of, um, of the theories of harms that we look at in vertical cases, at least in Canada. Thank you, Trevor. Um, picking up on one of your points, you talked about um, the lack of market power um, and low barriers to entry. I wonder whether, Hannah, you had a thought around the connection between raising barriers to entry and how that equates potentially to foreclosure and what kind of manner that can take. Yeah, um, I, think, I think it's very clear that, I mean, vertical mergers can raise barriers to entry and, and, um, and this was something that was already in a way mentioned a bit this morning in terms of when we were talking about the digital, digital mergers and how you know, access to additional data or acquisition of a large user base can raise barriers to entry. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to specifically talk about digital now, but, but a little bit more in, in general on, on barriers to entry. I think if one thinks, for example, of a situation where, I mean, as a result of the vertical merger, you remove, in a way, a large customer from the downstream market. Um, even if there are some other customers still remaining in the market, the competitors who are active in the upstream markets they may find themselves having to operate at or close to uh, minimum efficient scale. And that, in turn, then means that they will not only charge higher prices to the remaining downstream competitors and thus affecting the competition in the downstream market, but also raise barriers to entry in the upstream markets. Because effectively, if you can no longer make same kind of profits in the upstream markets, then that market becomes much less attractive for other companies to enter. And therefore, you can have this shutting off, in a way, of the, of the upstream markets as well. The other effect that this can have in the upstream market is that once that market becomes less attractive, um, and the, the companies that are still active there have less money to use, they will spend less on R&D, on innovation, cost reduction, product quality, and, and ultimately that could even lead to some upstream competitors exiting the market, let alone raising the barriers for new, enter, new entrants to come to those markets. And, and this means that you know, vertical mergers, they, they can, through this raising barriers to entry, have an effect not only in terms of the downstream market in raising costs of rivals, but also in the attractiveness of entry in the upstream market to new, new entrants. So that's one type of, of, of effect one could have as a result of the vertical merger. The, the other point that I wanted to raise with barriers to entry is, is very something that I see all the time, because I in particular focus on mergers in the energy sector. And there, of course, access to transmission networks is key. They are often monopolies, or, or at least near monopolies. And if upstream operators want to access the downstream market, you need access to the transmission network. And here, if you have a vertical merger between 
an upstream operator and a transmission network operator, you can, through various discriminatory actions, um, for example, you can degrade the transmission capacity, you can manage the congestion of the network in a manner that favors your you know, upstream operations. Um, you can strategically decide how and where you're gonna invest in further infrastructure expansion in a manner, again, that would favor your upstream um, uh, part of the operations and thus through these kind of actions, as a result of the vertical merger, you can really raise the barriers to entry for other upstream energy suppliers to access the market. And that's something that in particular in energy mergers we're very conscious of and we look at very carefully. Um, the third point that I wanted to raise, um, Trevor already touched upon, which is this access to sensitive information. Um, I mean, because ultimately what that can also do is dissuade competitors from entering markets because if competitors know that you have, as an upstream operator, you have access to downstream information or vice versa, um, this can also be very off-putting and raise the entry barriers um, to competitors. Um, not, not in the sense that it would be technically more difficult, but just that the commercial risk might actually grow of entering that market if you know that your competitors have access to sensitive information. And um, I'll also mention a few cases that we've looked at in, um, in, uh, at the European Commission relating to sensitive um, information. I mean, one was uh, GELM Wind, which was, uh, again, okay, energy related, um, but um, it was basically um, LM Wind, which manufactures wind turbine blades, and then GE that manufactures the, um, the turbines. Um, basically, competitors were very concerned about um, access to, to um, sort of uh, the turbine blade information that GE could have um, and could utilize um, to its benefit and vice versa. Um, Apple Shazam is another one where we um, looked at sensitive information that Apple might get um, on its rivals through Shazam. And then the third one I'll mention, I mean, there's been a number of more as well, um, was um, ASL Ariane Espace, which was between satellite launch services and satellite manufacturers. So there again, it was both upstream and downstream competitors had concerns about access to sensitive information. So it is something that we are also very, very conscious of. Thank you. So we've heard a number of the potential concerns with vertical mergers. But often, both guidelines and practice shows that vertical mergers are benign and can result in efficiencies and actually you know, aid companies in their um, competitive process going forwards. So I wanted to turn first to Hero as, a, as an economist to set out some of the, the interesting thoughts around efficiencies and then to John as one of our kind of more eminent <laughs> private practice practitioners to talk us through how actually in reality he's seen efficiencies be dealt with or not dealt with by um, competition agencies. So firstly to Hero, I mean, are vertical mergers always benign and always result in efficiencies that would outweigh any competition co effects? Okay, yeah. Uh, well, let me first say that, uh, as he said, uh, I was a uh, commissioner of the JFTC until two years ago, uh, but I'm no longer a member of that, and so therefore what I'm going to speak today is my own view and not the, any official view of the JFTC. And uh, I'm actually an economist, as Jerry has also mentioned. Uh, I would like to start uh, with an uh, economic discussions on efficiencies. Uh, that is, uh, the economics, economics on the efficiencies from vertical mergers. I believe that uh, in this relationship, one needs to separate between economies of vertical integration and the economies of vertical mergers. Uh, in terms of the economies of vertical integrations, uh, the, the issue has been raised by most notably two Nobel laureates and actually two Olivers. Uh, one is Oliver Williamson, uh, who stressed that the and the uncertainty and the asymmetricity of information transaction transaction costs may be reduced with the vertical integration. Uh, the other Oliver is uh, Oliver Hart 
who said that the vertical integration can increase the incentive for investment by ensuring the control of the city of rights. Uh, so uh, if these economies outweigh the, these economies of vertical integration, which can be also big, in, like uh, monitoring cost and uh, loss of incentives from reduced market competition. Uh, then, vertical integration is expected to result in certain efficiency. However, this does not necessarily mean that the, the vertical mergers are desirable, because such economies of uh, vertical integration can be uh, obtained through some form of uh, alliance without mergers or without the share ownership. Uh, in many countries and in many industries, we know that the long-term uh, and sometimes exclusionary vertical relationship is uh, common with no uh, little shareholdings, say between suppliers and assemblers, or between uh, manufacturers and wholesalers or retailers. In Japan, the so-called Keiretsu relationship or subcontracting relationship is uh, well known and uh, you can often observe in many industries. Therefore, to use the efficiency argument as a defense for vertical mergers, one has to show why this efficiency cannot be attained uh, just through alliance without share ownership. As far as I am aware, there has been no serious discussion of this issue in merger levies in Japan or as far as I know, in any other country as well. Now, coming to an, an act, the actual cases in Japan, I looked at the uh, JFTC's annual report on the review of selected major merger cases. During the past 10 years, 102 cases were reported in these uh, reports. And among these 102, 21 cases were related to vertical combinations, vertical mergers. Uh, among them, 15 were accepted without remedies, five were accepted with remedies, and one was uh, withdrawn. Uh, there, the question raised were uh, basically foreclosure and the sharing of information, just as uh, the two speakers had mentioned in the area. Uh, and in none of them, efficiency defense was raised. Uh, even though JFTC's merger guidelines list efficiencies are one of the factors that may be considered. Therefore, uh, we, Japan at least, has no experience in which we did uh, have a relative rating of efficiency versus uh, uh, harms. And uh, obviously, we have not uh, had any case of discussion in which uh, we consider the efficiencies whether the efficiencies come from the economies of vertical integration or really from uh, the economies of vertical mergers. Uh, let me also talk about uh, post-merger evaluation. JFTC has a research center called Competition Policy Research Center, or CPRC. And in uh, several, seven years ago, in 2011, CPRC evaluated the impact of mergers on the company's performance in several ways. Uh, in one of the studies, which used the stock price data, uh, we studied 15 merger cases, but only one of them was vertical mergers. Uh, the other ones, uh, the rest of that, uh, are all horizontal mergers. So uh, I looked at this uh, case of the uh, vertical merger and this was a, uh, a merger between a manufacturer of uh, ball bearings and a manufacturer of uh, uh, metal balls that are used in to make bearings. Uh, after the announcement of the acquisition, the so-called cumulative abnormal returns, uh, the so-called CAR, C-A-R, CAR, uh, was virtually zero for the bearing manufacturer and positive for the ball manufacturer. So uh, in that sense, the result says that the stock market evaluated the acquisition favorably, but all the gains went to the acquired one, which is the, uh, the uh, manufacturer of the metal balls. Uh, but this is the only one case that uh, at least uh, uh, in Japan has been studied. 
and uh, we cannot generalize the result to uh, particular matter in general. And uh, also, we do not know whether this uh, positive gain was due to efficiency or uh, other reasons. Although this, because this is a uh, uh, non-horizontal vertical merger, I believe that they did not because of the increased market power. But still, we do not know whether it's yet going to be consistent or not. So, stop there. So we've seen a single case there with an evaluation showing, um, at least at the, to my understanding, there's been an increase in the share price and the returns. John, I, I should imagine when you have companies come into you talking about the mergers they want to undertake, efficiencies are often you know, a large part of their rationale, particularly when it's a vertical merger. But I wondered whether you have seen in your dealings with agencies, efficiencies forming part of that overall agency analysis in vertical cases. Thanks, Charles. Uh, let me just first of all say thank you very much to the JV JFTC for organizing this wonderful event, uh, to the EC for asking me to be an NGA, and to Joel for asking me to join the panel. Um, Although I was a bit curious when you asked me to talk about um, efficiencies, uh, I thought perhaps you know I wasn't the right person. Um, and, and the reason for that is, in, in answering your question, is I have seen it very rarely. Um, uh, in fact, I don't think I've actually handled a vertical case where efficiencies were relevant to the analysis. I mean, and that's rather curious, I think, because you know, as you well know, you know, various guidelines. Um, uh, state um, the importance of, of efficiencies in vertical analysis. For example, the EC um, uh, non-horizontal guidelines say that vertical mergers you know, have a substantial scope for efficiencies. Um, the US guidelines uh, go slightly further and says the department will give relatively more weight to the expected efficiencies when deciding whether to challenge a vertical merger and, and, and we've heard and Trevor, that's something similar in, in, in Canada. So, you know, you, you would expect, therefore, for, for me, uh, uh, someone who does a fair amount of merger control, to, to um, move on from the, uh, the analysis that the clients offer to us about why they're doing a merger, which is often set out in, in, in the merger documents, and, and make a lot of that in the context of the, uh, of the notifications that we put together. But, but we, we don't do that, and, and you might say, why is that? Um, and it's because it, it doesn't seem to be a factor which um, the agencies that I'm used to dealing with um, want to naturally take into account. So there's a bit of a mismatch between um, the guidelines and, and, and the practice. Um, uh, when we're looking at the efficiencies, obviously the one that's most commonly claimed is the elimination of double marginalization or markups. Uh, there are you know, others in, in terms of efficiencies between the, the different parts of the um, organization. Um, I, I had a little look at the, the vertical merger study uh, that was done recently by the ISN that I think Joel was closely involved in. And there, in response to a question, 41 NCAs replied that they did take into account efficiencies in vertical merger analysis and only three said they didn't take them into account. Um, I think it'd be quite interesting, you know, perhaps in the, the more detailed analysis you say is underway to kind of dig into that uh, a little more. Um, um, so in my experience, scant attention is, is paid to the potential pro-competitive effects. Um, something was published in August of this year looking at um, recent telecoms and me media um, mergers in the US and the EC. This is done by an economist, Christina Kafara and others, and saw in only one of the four most recent cases was elimination of double marginalization accepted. Um, now, I know it's, it is for the parties to make uh, the case, and, and Professor um, Odakiri was saying that he hasn't seen that in, in, in Japan, and I think, I think there's definitely a, a weakness there. Um, I think to my, what is perhaps the explanation of that is that, that once a for potential foreclosure effect is identified in, in a vertical case, um, then it becomes the sole focus of attention. Um, and I'm wondering about whether actually the analysis, in the analysis there ought to be, um, given what the guidelines say is the policy, there ought to be more of a balancing between 
the pro-competitive effects and, the, and the, the potential foreclosure effect. Because what I think tends to happen now is that once the, the foreclosure effect is identified, um, one moves straight on to the issue of how you're going to resolve that, particularly in, in a phase one environment. Um, I don't know we're going to come on to, to the issue of remedies, um, but uh, I, I, th I think it, it almost there's a, there's a moment for reflection uh, now. Is, is the policy set out by the guidelines the right policy, or are we now seeing through, you know, through the lens of different cases like um, Time Warner, AT&T, you know, a, a different approach that requires you know, um, a, a different sort of analysis? But, but in terms of um, you know, wh where we currently are, I, I'm, I'm not seeing um, a, um, an efficiency analysis being relevant in, in the cases that, uh, that come across my desk. Thanks, John. Um, given one of the agencies that John is talking about is the European Commission, it would be unfair to not give Hannah a chance to respond. <laughs> Yeah, John was kind of looking at me sideways at one point when he was talking. <laughs> but uh, no, I think, look, I mean, we do recognize efficiencies, um, in particular from the elimination of double marginalization. But I think there is a point that, you know, it is for the parties also to bring the point and to make the case that there are efficiencies. And, you know, if they are merger specific, they're verifiable and they can benefit consumers, then we accept them. I mean, it. Whilst it, it may be true that we haven't recently cleared a vertical merger specifically on the basis of efficiencies, um, what this can lead to is, is less stringent remedies. Um, and um, I think one case, but it was a mix of vertical and horizontal concerns, is Orange Jastel, which was in the, in the telecom sector, um, mobile merger in Spain. And it had both horizontal and vertical overlaps. And there we did accept um, that efficiencies related to the elimination of double marginalization um, um, had been demonstrated to our requisite standard. Um, however, um, once these efficiencies were plugged into um, the calibrated merger simulation model that we um, used, we still saw significant price rises, um, but they were mainly a result of then the horizontal elements of the merger. So structural remedies were still needed. But in that case, we did actually accept that there was clear efficiencies from the elimination of double marginalization that arose from the vertical aspects of the merger. But the problem was we still had significant horizontal concerns there. It's interesting to hear you talk about the merger specific specificity. I'll always get that one wrong. Um, particularly given Hero has talked about the difference between vertical integration and vertical merger control and whether there's something there that means that actually that specificity is quite challenging to prove. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if, we, if we're talking about the remedies element and you talked about the need for a structural remedy in uh, the horizontal aspect of the case. Um, we've seen in the, the vertical mergers study that behavioral remedies are far more prevalent in um, vertical mergers. And actually last year at the ICN where we had a plenary at the annual conference, sorry, this year at the ICN annual conference, we talked uh, about behavioral remedies. And from the CMA's perspective, we often review our remedies, um, and we have uh, a number of behavioral remedies which go back for a number of years, particularly in kind of, as you talked about, energy and gas markets and those kind of what might be called natural monopolies. And we found that one of the particular challenges around those vertical memories uh, sorry, vertical memories, vertical mergers and behavioral remedies, the memory is strong, um, was that it, it can be very challenging to implement, monitor and enforce the behavioral remedy, um, and particularly where you're doing that over a long period of time. And actually, in, a, in an energy case, for example, there might be a change in the asset and a change in the way the asset is used or the need to kind of update the asset over time. So I guess on that, I wonder whether behavioral remedies are in fact the best solution to vertical concerns, or as the question says in front of me, are they actually an unattainable, unattainable unicorn, something that's very challenging to find, identify, and to um, be happy with? But firstly, I mean, for, for Trevor, why would you see behavioral remedies being more prevalent for vertical mergers? Yeah, I, I mean, I think Hannah struck the, the nail on the head and gave this answer a little bit, but I think that that is the, the recognition 
that um, vertical mergers um, do have oftentimes a pro-competitive um, or, effi or efficiency-enhancing aspects to them, and that when you couple that with the fact that the, um, the anti-competitive evil associated with those mergers um, is oftentimes behavioral in nature, um, that is to say it's something like denying access to inputs or customers or it's uh, related to the sharing of confidential information, um, the least intrusive remedy that still allows for a lot of those pro-competitive benefits um, to be realized um, may uh, be behavioral uh, in, in nature. And I, those, you know, examples of what those might be would be um, things like um, granting non-discriminatory non uh, access to, um, to networks and supply. Um, and getting the merchant entity to enter into long-term uh, contracts at fair and reasonable rates, um, the use of binding arbitration mechanisms, um, and uh, maybe, um, you know, oftentimes information firewalls to deal with the, the competitive uh, information issue. So recognizing those as kind of some of the classic behavioral remedies in vertical cases, how do you construct them so that they can be monitored and enforced, particularly over a reasonably long duration? Yeah, so speaking specifically of the experience in Canada, I think we've had some success, um, still with some challenges, but I think we've had some success in um, crafting behavioral remedies um, when the, uh, the major issue of concern related to the sharing of confidential information. Um, so in those instances, some of the key provisions that we've used to ensure the ability to monitor and enforce the, the, the remedy would be things like the uh, use of independent monitors that uh, you know have a, a good uh, knowledge of the relevant industry, uh, as well as uh, of the intention of the remedy and uh, and its form. Um, there might also be periodic reports and declaration of compliance from the merged entity, um, a commitment to notify of any breaches, um, again by the merged entity. Uh, and importantly, an ability to request and obtain information um, from the merged entity um, or to, if necessary, make site visits uh, to determine uh, or secure um, compliance with the, with the remedy agreement. Um, that being said, um, for other vertical concerns, um, such as foreclosure concerns, um, it's really hard to get around the need, uh, I think at least for structural fixes, anytime they're available. Um, because there's a number of issues with behavioral fixes that I don't think there are good solutions for. Um, a few of those difficulties would include things like, and, and you got at this, the, this a little bit, Joel, the temporal aspect of things. So a be behavioral remedy typically is, is going to be um, a temporary fix. Um, and the structural change in the market is, is relatively speaking, more permanent. Um, and that may be exacerbated by, um, by concerns over the raising of barriers to entry that Hannah so, uh, so eloquently um, described. Um, the big one for me, I think, is that behavioral restrictions don't remove the incentive problem. The, the vertical integration has, has, um, has changed the incentive for the merged entity and what we're we're forcing on, um, on the, the merged entity uh, in a behavioral fix is for them to act against their own best incentives, something that's never ideal in, in, in any situation. Um, and then another one that I think is big is that uh, the remedy design challenges are pretty significant for an, an antitrust agency. We're not industry experts. We're not in the industry all the time. Uh, and so it's very hard to craft effective behavioral fixes to, to get at all the different ways that the parties can um, can can behave, um, and um, merged entities have a great ability to adapt their behavior to get around these types of commitments. Uh, and as I just mentioned, uh, now the incentive to do so. Okay, so John, given Trevor's put forward some of the concerns that agencies have around these behavioral remedies, particularly in the construction and then the the monitoring and essentially the the incentive problem of the firm post uh, transaction where there's been a structural change in the market and you have a behavioral fix. How often do you find yourselves advising parties that they may well actually have to offer up behavioral remedies or structural remedies to get approval? Well, I think in, in, in a way, 
part of my role as an NGA is to is to offer a kind of different perspective. Um, um, and I'll tell you quite honestly that um, if someone's doing a significant vertical merger and the shares uh, upstream or downstream are quite significant, I'm usually almost without exception advising the parties you have to expect that you may well have to offer a remedy here. We can get into the, the, you know, the challenges of designing the remedy. And, and kind of why is that? And, and, and I say that because I think it's relatively easy to um, for a, a third party to to identify, you know, using the analytical framework of incentive ability, effective on competition, to identify a concern, but it's pretty hard for the agency to dismiss it um, adequately. And so there's a whole question there about, you know, what, you know, what, what standard of proof do you apply? And particularly if you're if you're if you're you know, you're working under a, a time frame that you want to get on with life, then you know if you're if you're, as it were, offered the prospect of a of a, a remedy in a phase one examination um, to be able to move on, you you you're you're quite likely to accept that. Um, and I you know I've I've been on obviously on both sides of the fence where I've I've been I've been. You know, frustrated because um, trying very hard to you know to dismiss a concern which you know, you know the client thinks is an unrealistic concern, but nevertheless, um, you know the concern has been kind of you know articulated and, um, and 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 the regulator you know doesn't feel comfortable, is unsure about going to phase two. Um, certainly, at the end of phase two, doesn't want to prohibit because of the risk of over enforcement. So. Um, I think you know there, there there is a risk of 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 you know behavioural remedies you know being you know kind of as it were an easy way out in 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 some vertical cases and this time I can see Anna's looking looking at me by the corner of her eye, um, um, but you know I'm, I'm expressing I'm expressing concerns that that you know the private sector uh, sees. Um, um, you know that said, you know I think that if we go back to you know the the proposition that, that vertical mergers, you know, can often produce um, um, efficiencies. You, you you want to be comfortable that that you're not either over enforcing nor that you, your your remedy is 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 reducing materially those those potential efficiencies. Um, on the point about um, kind of enforcement. Um, and you know the challenge of putting it together um, over time. I, I, I'll be honest with you and say that I, I've never been easily persuaded by the the, um, the statement. Oh well, you know it, it, we, we don't want to you know have you know the the challenge of of, of having to devise the remedy. Um, and I'm even more concerned about you know some statements that have come out from certain sectors recently saying you know that we we you know, we want to kind of limit behavioural remedies because you know if that means you know more enforcement then I think some errors can be made. But I do think that you know a combination of the kind of things that you were mentioning, Trevor, actually make it possible um, you know for for a transaction to proceed, therefore give rise to the perceived benefits. You know, it's a combination of of um, uh, you know effective you know negotiation up front it's a combination of making the market work um, you know through monitoring mechanisms you know the reporting mechanisms and and, and, and so forth um, uh, and then you obviously need to have the you know the ability to kind of look at it again after five years and see if if, if, if it's still needed um, but, but I think that you know that there are, there are there are lots of good examples of where those types of mechanism uh, have have worked um, and I think um, you know it, it's it, it, it's relatively easy to kind of dismiss them because I think that I think you know that there there are um, good examples that can be worked on, uh, and th those agencies who haven't haven't used them yet, you know, I'd recommend that you know you look at those, for example, in Canada and in the EC, because I think that you know that they they can provide solutions uh, and a, an appropriate balance in terms of the the enforcement uh, the, the force the enforcement that's needed. So. Two thoughts to follow up on that. Firstly, I mean, in terms of exploring behavioural remedies, so CMA has done some ex post studies um, and reviewed remedies, and one of our key concerns has been where we've had to frequently review the same remedy to see that it's still fit for purpose, that it's still actually working, and the time and effort, and also the, just the changing dynamics can be quite challenging there. But one of the points I wanted 
to pick up on with you was around competitor complaints and whether the, the behavioral remedies are essentially that um, you know the easiest outcome for the the agency now i'm not going to turn to hannah this time i think she's already had the chance to push back although i do want to comment <laughs> <laughs> but uh, i was thinking i mean competitor complaints or at least competitor interaction third party interaction is is the lifeblood of merger control you know you you get the input from the customer you get the impact from the competitor it's one way that you understand the industry and trevor i wondered for you how you consider competitor complaints or that interaction with competitors when you're doing particularly vertical mergers yeah, I, I think the simple answer is that it's it's um, it's not that much different than the usual case. I mean, the competitors um, will all, almost always have an incentive to to be somewhat obstructionist in 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 terms of their their interactions with us in, in in the merger review to try to harm their rival. It may be somewhat more acute in the vertical uh, context because of uh, um, of the types of concerns that they raise, but. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I mean, it doesn't change the fact that they remain, you know, one of the key, key sources for some of the most important information that we're going to gather in the, over the course of a merger review, and particularly in a vertical case where they can, they can uh, speak, um, you know, specifically to the, to the mechanisms through which they may be foreclosed. Um, an agency is always going to consider those complaints um, within the proper context and is going to weigh them. Uh, against what they hear from the rest of the market um, and from uh, and what they see uh, in the rest of the information that they gather, whether that be documents, data, or otherwise. So I'll give John a, a chance to respond, and then <laughs> Hannah the final say. I, it wasn't. A, I was just listening. It, it, it suddenly dawned on me. You know, you, you, you quite rightly used the you know, expression foreclosure. And by the way, you know, I mean vertical mergers are the one area where. It, it, all agencies seem to be comfortable to talk to competitors. I mean, even in the U.S., I think you know that you know that's you know that that's acceptable. Um, but for me, the you know the ultimate when you've applied the analytical framework, the, the ultimate question is what do we mean by foreclose? Because you know making life difficult for a competitor is not foreclosure, and that's my, that for me is the challenge as to where you draw the yeah. line. Yeah, that's a fair repost, Hannah. Yeah. No, no, and. I, I think that's that's fair enough. I, I agree with that. But I think I just wanted to pick very quickly on one point that that John sort of said that behavioural remedies are easy way out for regulators. I mean, I think we try very hard to investigate vertical mergers and complaints that we get from customers or competitors um, as much as we can in a phase one, for example. And I would personally, if I can get to the bottom of the complaints and I have solid facts to clear, I would much rather clear than take a behavioral remedy. So I don't think that we view the behavioral remedy as an easy way out by any means. I don't think I'd be doing my job if I hadn't provoked a little. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's fair and I think, I mean, saying behavioral remedies are easy in any circumstances <laughs> is a challenge. Hero. May I also make a long comment about this issue of the behavioral remedy? Uh, generally speaking, uh, I'm not a big fan of the behavioral remedy, but in the case of this uh, uh, vertical mergers, in most of the, at least in the in Japan, the most, almost all the, <coughs> the uh, remedies on vertical mergers were uh, requirement that the, the company supply to the computers the, as uh, the input and so forth. Uh, in that, in this case, as you mentioned, that the competitor may complain if the, the companies are not uh, complying with the, the remedy requirements. So in that sense, uh, it's rather easy to monitor. So it's a one merit. And in this respect, I think the, the case is very similar to the case of uh, uh, patent licensing, whether it's vertical or horizontal mergers. Uh, there are cases in which the uh, patents are required to license to everyone who wants to get the license on a firm basis. Uh, and uh, in Japan, there was one study, this was quite, uh, well, probably almost 10 years ago or so, uh, there was one study uh, of the case in which the, the two uh, vendor machine companies uh, merged. And uh, we approved, but the, the remedy uh, was uh, that the companies would uh, license the, the patents to everyone on a regular basis. And the, the FTC made an uh, exposed study of the cases and then uh, found that uh, nobody has actually got the license. 
And at least one reason that some of those uh, competitors did not know about the, the presence of that remedy. Ah, so uh, my point is that the you know, behavior remedy may be used in some in certain cases, but the, it is very, very important to publicize that uh, the presence of that feature <laughs> to all those uh, companies involved. It's uh, an interesting note around actually the use of the whatever behavioural remedy you put in. I mean, the idea of patent licence and Fran, I would suggest that we haven't actually seen it given a very easy ride. Um, you know, there's been lots of private cases taken on that and, and industries looking at it. Um, I'm recognising that we've just had the, the 10 minute sign <laughs> held up. Um, just moving beyond vertical mergers for a second and thinking about other non-horizontal mergers, which is somewhere that the, the ICN project may move to in the next couple of years, um, particularly around kind of conglomerate mergers. Um, and I guess, firstly to Hannah, whether there's a link between the vertical effects and other non-horizontal effects such as conglomerate. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll try to be very quick. Um, I think, I mean, obviously conglomerate mergers is, is neither horizontal nor vertical relationship. It's about companies active in closely related markets and how you can utilize your power from one market into, into another market, um, normally through tying or bundling or, or other sort of exclusionary measures. Um, but I think there the, the, um, the um, framework of assessment is still the same. It's still about foreclosure. It's still about assessing ability, incentive, and effect. So that doesn't really change whether you're looking at vertical or conglomerate um, merger ultimately. Um, I think most of the conglomerate mergers we at the Commission have looked at um, recently all relate to the IT sector. And then going back to remedies, they, the issues we have found, um, namely relate to interoperability, and then the remedies have been um, more like structural access remedies um, than pure behavioral remedies. Um, relating to guaranteeing interoperability. And these are cases like Qualcomm NXP, Broadcom Brogade, uh, Microsoft LinkedIn, and um, also sometimes in the sort of medical sector, we had one case, um, then Slicerona, which related to dental chair systems. And then just one last word about um, the recent conglomerate merger that wasn't IT sector that we looked at, which was SLO Luxotica, which will be one of the cases that will be looked at as a case study in the, in the ICN. Um, um, sort of further, further um, analysis. And there, that case was obviously about bundling lenses and frames. And ultimately, we found no concerns after a phase two investigation. Um, and I think in the US, they looked at it as well. But there, the concern was more a classical vertical concern, um, as one of the parties had big retail operations there, which they didn't in Europe. Thank you. Um, so you, you raise a number of cases there that given this morning session when we talked about technology and well, various phrases put up by our uh, esteemed Portuguese colleague around all the different ways that these things can be described and the different terms that can be used. I mean, Hero, I wonder from an economist's point of view whether there's a common analytical framework across the vertical and the conglomerate and whether this is something that you know, can be used appropriately in these acquisitions by the, the different platforms and so on. Okay, uh, before going to that uh, topic, uh, I want to mention about uh, what happened in Japan. I, I mentioned uh, in, in my earlier discussion about those uh, uh, JFTC's reports on selected major, major cases in the past 10 years or so. And in there, I found that the nine cases of conglomerate mergers, that is non-horizontal and non-vertical, uh, in, among these nine, five were product expansion and uh, four were geographical expansion. So there was no case of pure conglomerate mergers uh, in Japan uh, in the past 10 years or so. Uh, in the cases of product expansion mergers, uh, just like in the cases of vertical mergers, uh, the FTC's reviews were sent out on issues of foreclosure effects or sharing of information. Uh, in a few cases, it's about timing. timing. Uh, again, efficiency defense was raised in none of the cases, even though theoretically one can refer to uh, the economies of scope, just like the economies of vertical integration in the cases of vertical mergers. Uh, theoretically, if the economies of scope are real, congruent mar mergers can raise entry <coughs> barriers by increasing the amount of capital needed for entry because the entrant need to enter with the same scope of business. 
Uh, however, uh, well, actually, this issue I think is very much related to the issue of concentration. Uh, in June, I was invited to the meeting of OECD Competition Committee as uh, an expert to speak at the roundtable of market concentration. Uh, for, to make a speech on that, I made uh, some inquiry and then I found that for Japan, uh, there was no clear trend of increasing concentration. But uh, some of the other speakers, particularly for the United States, uh, they said that concentration has been increasing and argued that conglomerate mergers in the high-tech sectors are responsible for this increased concentration. Uh, well, uh, as uh, has been mentioned uh, in the other uh, sessions, in the, in the morning session, some of those uh, conspicuous, conspicuous cases of uh, mergers were brought by big platforms <coughs> against uh, startups in related technologies or related markets. Uh, I do not know if such accusation is correct, but uh, I agree that, this, that uh, it is something to be worried. Uh, however, from the viewpoint of competition agency, I think there are at least three difficulties. First, the acquired firms are usually still small uh, and with uncertain future, and this makes it very difficult for competition authorities uh, to notice or predict any effects. Uh, second, the merger may actually lead to a better service for the benefit of consumers by, for instance, improving, uh, improving the services you can enjoy with your smartphones. And thirdly, and probably most uh, importantly, the agencies have little capacity to predict the future course of technological change and social needs. So we do not know whether the kind of big platforms will continue to be dominant uh, or such dominance will be undermined by the Schumpeterian process of creative uh, destruction. Uh, this is a very difficult question and uh, I'm, I'm sure that, that this has been you know, discussed repeatedly in many of those uh, sessions in this workshop. But uh, this is, uh, I believe, I still believe that this is uh, the, probably the most uh, difficult and most important question that we have to face. Thank you, Hira. So recognizing we've only got a couple of minutes left, I'm gonna open it to the floor if anybody <coughs> has a burning question they'd like to ask about vertical mergers or to a member of the panel in particular. It's always nice to have a stunned silence and obviously <laughs> an excellent dinner and um, a nice warm room. Um, <laughs> I guess then I'm going to throw this open slightly differently and, and ask the panel whether they would like to ask a fan fellow panel member a particular question or follow up on one of the points that they've raised so far. No? You, More stunned you silence. You, you, you <laughs> sprung that on us. Okay. I, I, I just make an observation. On, uh, it's really not the subject of the panel because we're talking about vertical ones, but you touched on conglomerate uh, mm. effects. And I, I just say again, as from the point of view of a practitioner, if I'm doing something that's you know, transatlantic, um, I mean, it, it's curious that, um, you know, we, we would approach a, a merger that, that maybe gives rise to conglomerate effects um, in, in the following way. We, we would expect to engage with the European Union pretty thoroughly on the issues, particularly if, if there was a, you know, a product that could be regarded as a, a must-stock product. Um, we wouldn't necessarily think that you know, that would lead to you know, a prohibition or even a remedy, but we would expect it to be looked at extremely carefully and thoroughly. And indeed, you know, there are, you know, in the case notes that the Commission very helpfully publishes, there's a statement after one of them saying, you know, that, that you know, the Commission will examine conglomerate effects, and so that's you know, that's a kind of move back in a sense to you know a previous time, and yet if we would at the same time in that measure dealing in the U.S. or perhaps even Canada, we, we would scarcely think about it because we know that that issue isn't going to be looked at in in any serious way. It'll be dismissed pretty quickly by the case team, you know, and that strikes me as being a very odd situation. Um, and probably one of the areas where there is, you know, the greatest difference uh, between you know, Europe on the one hand and, and, and the US on the other. Um, but it's a practical note, um, but one that, you know, does come up fairly regularly. Thank you. So it's always nice to finish a plenary at an international competition network by highlighting some of the differences between agencies um, <laughs> and some of our biggest agencies across the pond from each other. Um, so. 
I'd firstly like to thank all the panel for their time and effort that they put into preparing for this um, and for the excellent interactions that they've had today. Um, and then I'd like to thank the JFTC for hosting us and uh, wish you a, a good journey onto your next breakout session on vertical mergers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for everyone participating in this session.